Welcome to Sportsbeat KC, the Kansas City Star's daily sports podcast. It's Tuesday, March 23rd, and I'm Blair Kirkhoff. What in the world was that from Kansas last night in the NCAA tournament? The Jayhawks were eliminated by Southern California by 34 points in a second round game that was never competitive. That's the type of margin you might see from a number one seed playing a number 16, but Kansas was a three, USC a six. Stunning. On today's show, beat writers Gary Bedore and Jesse Newell dig through the rubble and try to determine what happened in a game that turned out to be the third worst loss in program history. We also talk about all the unanswered questions for the Jayhawks going forward and what's next for the program from a roster and NCAA investigation standpoint, plus comment on the Big 12's underwhelming tournament. So let's get started on Sports BKC. All right, so the, Kansas has played, I think I looked this up, I, I looked it up, so I think I'm right, 110 NCAA tournament games in its, in its storied history. So that means they've played the equivalent of three full seasons against quality opposition if you you know if you just laid out all the NCAA tournament games, so when when you play that many games against that much quality opposition, you're going to see some unusual things from time to time, and so one of those unusual things happened on Monday night in Indianapolis, where Kansas and ended up I think a one point a, a tip off a one point underdog to USC, but KU was the better seed, right? A number three versus a number six. Well, they got uh, they got nipped by 34 points to um, to Southern California. Gary, let's start with the historical nature of of the loss in the NCAA tournament for for Kansas. Where um, on on the on the lists of bad losses for Kansas and and Coach Bill Self, where where does this one rank? Well, in history at KU, their previous worst loss in the tournament was 18 points to Indiana in the 1940 title game in Kansas City. So they almost doubled their worst loss in NCAA history. But in the Bill Self era, it passed that loss to Kentucky in the regular season several years ago, which was a 32-point loss. But as you pointed out, and I just checked, I guess this loss is their third overall worst defeat in any game in the school history. They lost to Nebraska 48 to eight in 1900 and they lost by 37 to Kentucky in 74. After that, it's a 33 pointer to Oklahoma state. So this 34 pointer would be your third worst loss in school history which is really weird because this team has had so many nights where we've had to look up stuff that's crazy like this. And yet they still had a three seed and went 21 and nine, which was a good season. So that's some historical perspective, how badly they got beat last night in a tournament game. Yeah, so that in the, in that twenty one and nine season included a victory over Baylor in the in the final weeks of the regular season, and I just want to refer back to that nineteen forty title game loss to Indiana. That was the second year of the NCAA tournament, and the game before that, the game that allowed Kansas to play for the national championship, which was the the second one in, in NCAA history, they beat Southern California mm. um, in what was then called the Western Regional Final, but what we today would know it as the the national semifinal game. So, yeah, um, Jesse, nobody saw this coming, obviously, including Vegas. And, um, and, and, and you didn't see it coming. I didn't, nobody saw it coming. You, couldn't, you could not see it coming. So let's try to, let's try to you know, with the autopsy here, determine what happened last night. Where, where do you begin to, to describe what happened to KU last night? Yeah, when you lose by 34, a lot of stuff happens, obviously. Uh, for Kansas, especially like you said, Blair, when it's a coin flip type game. So I, I wrote this in the analysis piece after the game, and it, a lot of things can be true at the same time. You know, I mean, I, I would ascribe about 20 of those points to a 40 minute sample three point shooting luck, basically. I mean, 
USC shot 11 of 18 from three. You know, I heard, I've read a lot of people saying, okay, you need to defend threes better. It's been a bugaboo for self. And obviously the last four tournament games that they've lost have been teams shooting really well from three. If you're talking about Oregon, Villanova, Auburn, and now USC, the studies would tell you that it's really hard to do anything with three point defense besides limiting attempts. And KU basically limited USC attempts. USC didn't take a ton of them. They don't take a ton of them for the year. So the fact that a guy, I was looking up these numbers. Isaiah Moby started the game four for four from three. I, I was looking at for Kansas. The closest guy he would resemble from three point range would be like Tristan and Aruna. Okay. Can you imagine if Tristan and Aruna walked into an NCAA tournament game, hit four of his first four threes, including a step back? I mean, KU Nation would be on fire, basically, because they'd be like, who is this guy? What happened to Tristan Aruna? And, and what is going on in this game? So for USC to make 11 of 18, that's probably 15 points right there for USC. And then KU's threes, they got better looks than they made. And, and obviously, they shot a little bit over their heads against Eastern Washington. But to make six of 25, I mean, that's, you know, that's another six or eight points or six or nine points that, that KU didn't get. So you start with that. But kind of what are in my piece was just, Here's where KU went really wrong is how they won games down the stretch, how Bill Self was so proud of them, how they had come to grow into their identity was they had locked down defensively until their offense could figure things out. And that was sort of the point at the eight-minute mark of the first half. KU was down eight, really hadn't figured things out offensively, were kind of struggling, but that's really where they would lock in, get after teams defensively, get that lead to, to five or four by halftime, and in the second half, things would open up and they would make a run. KU gave up layup, layup, dunk, layup, couple threes, layup. Uh, they were out. They, they were outside of themselves. They did not play like Kansas. So it's sort of weird. I mean, we can we can go in a lot of different directions with this, but I mean, it, it really is your perspective here. Um, I, I put this on Twitter uh, right after the game, but KU under Bill Self. If you look at the Ken Palm numbers after that big blowout loss, it's the worst team he's ever had, according to predictive metrics. It's the worst offense he's ever had. It's the worst shooting team he's ever had. And yet all those things are true. And KU finished second in the Big 12 when seven teams made the tournament. And KU was a three seed in the NCAA tournament. So, um, again, what's your perspective there? If this is Bill Self's worst season in 18 years and KU's a three seed, makes the round of 32, it's pretty good. But if this is, you know, the sign of something to come, then that's pretty bad. And the other thing I want to mention is we all have to kind of go back and take a step back and think about the backdrop. KU's lost to Auburn in the round of 32 in 2019. Disappointing, obviously. Um, got run out of the gym. This loss against USC, disappointing. Got run out of the gym. How would everybody feel about that if last year's KU had made the NCAA tournament, been the overall number one seed, made a Final Four, potentially won a national championship? Both of those would have been understandable. Both of those would have been shrugged off. But that's not the reality KU lives in. So, again, I, I can go a lot of different perspectives on this. But um, the bottom line is it sort of depends on your perspective. But a lot of things have to go wrong to lose by 34. A lot of things went wrong for Kansas, uh, obviously, on Monday night. I thought about that last night, too, after the game, that not being able to compete in last year's, not having an NCAA tournament last year, uh, with the basically the sandwich being the bread being the 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 loss to Auburn and now the loss to USC really makes it difficult for for Kansas fans. They they look some teams didn't get to the NCAA tournament in, in nineteen and in and, and twenty one and um, and we, we there was a narrative a national narrative about how Dayton was really um, uh, you know was the big loser by not having the NCAA. When when is Dayton gonna, ever going to have a season like it had in twenty twenty? And I get that I absolutely do. But but the way last you know the, the game ended for Kansas last night after what happened in the previous appearance in the NCAA tournament just leaves me thinking that that Kansas was dealt one of the worst hands anyway when it comes to uh, college the way college basketball ended in in 2020. Um, I wanted to say I didn't know this and you 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 reinforced it Jesse and I didn't know this until I heard the broadcast last night that worst Kansas shooting team not only in the Bill Self era but. I think since I think Ian, e, Ian Eagle said something like 72 73 season I didn't, I didn't realize this Kansas team was shooting so poorly and you know I, I do agree with the assessment about the final eight minutes of, of the first half Kansas Kansas started picking it up offensively then they just couldn't stop Southern Cal at the same time so they, they did get things figured out on the offensive side 
They did need to get some stops. They could not get stops. But I also think, Gary, I'd be curious to know what you think about this as well, that uh, the beginning of the game, there was opportunity for Kansas to establish something. I, th- I thought they were playing pretty good defense early on. I thought the the, the Garrett on Evan Mobley was working, and uh, things things were happening for you know Kansas wasn't scoring. They didn't score in the first five minutes of the game, but USC I also started poorly offensively, one for six or one for seven to start the game. So the score at the first TV timeout was like five to three, and Neither team playing well, and I thought, okay, you know, Kansas, which didn't play, didn't start well against Eastern Washington. They're not starting well tonight, but if they just hit a couple shots and, and maybe, you know, inch ahead, this this thing will be a back-and-forth game, and, and I kind of like Kansas's chances, especially when you learned, and I didn't know this going in, Southern Cal, one of the worst free-throw shooting teams in the country, you know, challenged offensively, but when Kansas just never – when USC started scoring – you know, after maybe around the second TV timeout, Kansas couldn't get anything going for another few minutes. And then it became a double-digit deficit. And, and I thought, boy, the way the way USC plays defense, and, 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 and it's not a coaching mismatch. Andy Enfield's a good coach. We saw him take Florida Gulf Coast to the Sweet 16 if, um, back in, what was that, 2013. The guy can coach. I thought Kansas was in real trouble. So, Gary, I, that's a long-winded way of me trying to figure out when you thought KU was in trouble last night. Well, uh, like you, I thought, oh, oh boy, they're <clears throat> they're off to another one of these horrific starts where you have to think, will they score 13 points this half like they did at <laughs> TCU that one year? <laughs> I mean, we always will know that will be the low water mark for a half, but – KU is on pace again to barely top the 20 point mark. But again, like you said, USC wasn't expanding it that much. It was nine points, just like the Eastern Washington game. But then I think it was a 10 0 or 11 0 run. And uh, when it's 19 at half, you think this game is probably over. KU, you know, could come back for a historic comeback, biggest comeback in school history from a halftime deficit is 15 points. So uh, that 11-0 run or 10-0 run at the end of the half was really pivotal. And once again, in my mind, I was just thinking, I thought, okay, you had gotten over these disastrous halves, but uh, it was a horrible, horrible start where they barely – you know, scored 20 points. And, and then USC ends up playing better offense in the second half, shooting-wise. They shoot a better percentage, at least when the starters were in. I, I don't. I, I guess I, maybe I didn't see the final stats, but I was noticing the second-half box, and USC was just they, – they weren't missing threes. Um, they, they were just playing – it was hard to believe that they, were, they, were, they picked up the pace offensively in the second half after the way the, the first half had ended for them. So – at that point, I think their you know you, their confidence was soaring. You saw their bench celebrate every three and every dunk, and this was just a, a team that was feeling it. And I don't know if if um, if they'll ever shoot like that again. Um, it, you know, it, the, the odds are they won't, right? Uh, yeah. But they did for they did they did for this game. The other thing, Gary, I, before I forget about it. You know, Kansas has had games in the NCAA tournament over the years where they won by 30, 40 points, right? Usually in a 116 situation when you're playing, um, you know, an opponent that's, you know, the champion of a, of a low major. But I also remember Kansas winning a game like this in the Final Four once. Do you remember that Marquette game back in 03? Yep. It was a Dwayne Wade and um, this, you know, Kansas was up like 35 early in the second half of that game. And... Again, I'll just go back to what I said originally. When you play enough NCAA tournament games, you're you're going to see you're going to see things like this. I just, um, I, I but as as, as you, both of you were saying, with this team, especially player like Marcus Garrett, who was a National Defensive Player of the Year last year, and um, and getting Jalen Wilson back, I thought was going to be a you know a plus yeah. for Kansas. He, he might as well not have played in that game. He was he was totally a non-factor. Do you guys agree? Oh yeah, yeah he was, and um, 
it is weird. Blair, it's starting to get weird. I, you want to just say that, you know, man, this is just kind of a bad times for Kansas. And I, I'm looking up, I like effective field goal percentage because that gives you one and a half per, times the credit for three pointers because they're worth one and a half times the points. But, uh, I mean, like Bart Torvik's site, you can go back uh, to 2008, the 2007 2008 season. And I can look up Kansas and the best shooting performances against Kansas. Um, and I'm counting up the USC game was the fifth best shooting performance against the Kansas team since 2008. The fourth best was Villanova in the final four in 2018. <laughs> the tenth best was Auburn in 2019. Mm. So, like, I, I guess it's just a weird way of saying, uh, you know, I'm I'm Mr. Numbers guy, and I'm the guy that says, hey, if you roll the dice sometimes, you're going to get 12 three times in a row. Sometimes weird statistical outlier things happen. But if I'm telling you in the last 13 or whatever is 14 seasons that three of the worst 10 defensive performances from shooting percentage against Kansas or the best. If you're looking at the opponent, three of the top 10 all came in the NCAA tournament in KU's last three losses of the NCAA tournament. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, what do you make of that? I, I mean, is it a team not being prepared? Is the team being too tight? Is KU just super unlucky? I, I, I don't know. That that's, that's a weird, weird number, but, but KU literally has been run out of the gym by shooting teams three consecutive NCAA tournaments. And again, it's a shame that KU didn't play in 2020. Things could have been different there. But uh, that, that's something I, I don't, again, I don't know really how to wrap my mind around that when you've played so many games over that course of time and to have three of those 10 outlier performances all end your season in the last three seasons. That's sort of weird. You know, Jesse, when I think about those, th those particular losses to, to Nova, to Auburn, and, and to USC, especially the first two, those performances weren't outside the personality of those teams. They just executed at a level that maybe they hadn't in, in, all season or in, in, in that pressure, you know, the one and done situation, which was amazing and, and all due credit to those teams. For USC, um, this, they had a good season, right? They were, they co-champs or they tied for first in the regular season of the Pac-12. But I, I got to think that more they played out of their mind more than either Auburn or Villanova did in in the previous two. I'm not trying to explain it away. I'm just trying to, as as you are trying to understand it. But that that is an amazing statistic. Three out of the ten best shooting performances against KU since 08 have come in season ending losses. It uh, in the last it, three years <laughs> it, it, or the last three seasons with NCAA tournaments. Yes, right. That is that is unbelievable. Hey, it's Blair. We have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners, unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Star's award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns presented on the KansasCity.com site, and it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. Your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50 unless you tell us to cancel. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star, and that support has never been more important. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. Let's talk about um, let's talk about the Big 12 for a second. Uh, it started out so well for the conference, right? They won their first six games. They should have. They were they were favored by seed, and I think probably in Vegas on the Vegas line um, to to win those games. the The most impressive probably was Oklahoma's win over Missouri because it was an eight nine eight nine game, and um, and so the Big 12 goes into the final game of the get you know, with seven teams. The first six win. The, the final game looks like a, a walkover type of um, outcome. Uh, third seeded Texas against 14 seed Abilene Christian. And that's where the fortune turns for the Big 12. Abilene Christian pulls the upset. And the only victory for the Big 12 since then was Baylor's, vic was Baylor's uh, win over Wisconsin in the second round. So all the big Baylor is the only Big 12 team remaining in the tournament this 
from a season in which all seven Big 12 teams were um, were a top eight seed or better, and it's um, it, it's another disappointing effort by the Big 12 so far in the tournament. Ba- look, I think Baylor's good enough to win the national championship. Certainly, to go to the Final Four, and that will erase some of the some of the sting from a conference perspective. But it's kind of hard to hard to explain what's happened to the Big 12 on the first weekend of of the tournament, Jesse. Would you want to take a swing at it? Yeah, and you know, I'm I'm the one who's going to sit here and and preach big picture because the NCAA tournament I, I cut, sort of talked about this a little bit on Twitter yesterday, but it's sort of chaos on chaos. I mean, basketball already is a volatile sport. It has a lot of variance depending I just told you I mean, KU's game against USC swung 20 points because one team made more threes than it usually does, and the other team made fewer threes. So in these coin flip type games, coming in the round of 32, things are going to happen, and sometimes your 60-40s are going to go the 40 way. Sometimes the 75-25s are going to go the 25 way. So I would preach big picture. I mean, I I would still say that the Big Ten is the best conference, even though it's kind of had a disappointing thing. I I would kind of shrug a little bit off just saying, hey, if they ran the tournament again, that the Big 12 would have more than this many teams, more than one team in the Sweet 16. Having said that, I mean, the Pac-12 is making up ground here. You know, like you really can't argue with what the Pac-12 has done. And I love a line that that Vi Gregorian, our, our fellow columnist, used um, with the Les Miles situation. At, at some point, perception is reality. And so that's the problem for the Big 12 because it's sort of the same thing with Kansas. You know, you can talk about how Kansas doesn't play up to its seed and, and maybe they're overseeded every once in a while and, and all these sorts of things. But, you know, at some point, the perception out there is going to be how good was the Big 12? Well, how well did it perform in the NCAA tournament? And everybody knows that that sort of is a standard that everybody looks at. So for the Big 12 to get one team in this week's 16 is obviously disappointing. And like I said, if they reran the, the NCAA tournament, I'm sure there'd be a lot of times where there'd be four or five. Um, that's not the way things turned out. And um, that, that's obviously a major disappointment for the Big 12 and, and even for the Big 10 at this point in the year, just that that did not turn out the way that everybody had thought. I, I still, again, I, I would still stand here and tell you that the Big 10 is the best conference. If you look back at some of the predictive type numbers, it would tell you that the Big 12 was actually a little bit down this year because it had more bad teams in there, uh, like the uh, K-States and the Iowa States and the TCs of the world really dropped off. But um, I would still say the Big 12 was the second best conference over the course of the year, but mm. man, the Pac-12 maybe could change my mind here over the last couple of weeks because they have been lighting it up and they obviously have had a great NCAA tournament. Maybe a little more difficult to evaluate con- conference strength this year just because schools lost a hand, every school lost a handful of non-conference games and that's really the only way you can measure. Uh, you, you measure conference strength by what happens in November and December and there largely was no November basketball for in, in this year in the sport. So we had a handful of non-conference games to to evaluate. And Kansas did really well in those games, you know, beating Creighton and and you know, it's a team that's that's pushed through to the 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 Sweet 16 and and of course had success, enough success in the conference to finish second and get a number three seed. And you're absolutely right about the Pac-12. What a what, you know. Teams have just been running into a buzzsaw when they play these Pac-12 teams. Oklahoma State against Oregon State was, um, you know, wow. It was it was an eye opener to me the way Oregon State is playing right now. Um, so I think nine and one the Pac-12 is in in um, in the NCAA tournament. Again, a conference that that doesn't get a lot of national respect just because of where it's located and what times what time its games are on television, but. Uh, Salute to, to the uh, Pac-12 for having the, the tournament that it's that it has uh, had. They've got four teams in the Sweet 16, and only one for the Big 10, which is Michigan, and only one for the Big 12, which is Baylor. But if Baylor pushes through, if they get two wins and get to the Final Four, it'll be the the third straight NCAA tournament in which a Big 12 team has been represented in the Final Four, with Kansas in 18 and Texas Tech going to the t- title game in 19, and Baylor this year. So I think that would at least um, you know maybe take a little bit of the sting out of the the conference performance for the Big 12. Hey Gary, so let's let's spin it forward and talk about next year. I know the it's not even since as as we're recording this, it's not even 12 hours since uh, since Kansas uh, lost the game, but it's time to you know, people want to know what what this team looks like for next year. There are so many unknowns, but and I'll talk to Jesse about the off-court unknowns here in a second. But how about 
who 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 do we think is returning from from the from this roster? Who do we know is returning, and how do, how do things shape up? Well, right now they have KU has filled all thirteen scholarships, so they're actively recruiting grad transfers and recruits high schoolers. So any signees they get from now on, somebody has to leave. Mitch Lightfoot is coming back for another year, taking advantage of the NCAA's rule that will let you have another year in response to the pandemic year. His his scholarship won't count against the 13. Uh, same with if Garrett decided to come back and take advantage of that rule, his would not count either but most people expect him to start his pro career. Uh, they're bringing in three pop, three f- front court players right now, two high schoolers and Sidney Curry from Logan Community College. He's been compared to more a Barkley type power forward. Zach Clements of uh, Sunrise Christian is more of a Nick Collison type and Kate or uh, I think I said KJ Adams is more of a Darnell Jackson type if you want to compare them to players. <clears throat> but uh, I think KU's after a grad transfer point guard, they'll, they should be able to pick between a lot of them because there's going to be a ton of players in the transfer portal right now. They've, uh, a couple of recruits have said they're considering KU, a point guard from Northeastern, a high school point guard who committed to Creighton, Washington, uh, from Compass Prep, who has KU on his list, and a couple other grad transfers already have KU on their list. So whoever, right now they're full at 13, which has happened in other years, and all of a sudden guys start transferring. In the year of Zoom, we don't really know what Tristan and Aruna and Tyron, Tyon Grand Foster think about their progress this year. Are they happy? Are they not? Do they want to transfer? Are they committed? Latrell Josell and Jethro Muscadin, scholarship players who did not play at all, really, are they happy? Is Bill Self happy with them? Do they want to stay? So uh, those are just a few names to throw out there. Will Ochai Egbaji test the waters? I would. Will David McCormack test the waters? You would think maybe not because it's obvious, you know, there's some things to work on, but it happens. So that's a little peek at at the future. Like you started this question with a ton of unknowns. Yeah. And that, that goes for uh, events uh, away from the floor too, doesn't it, Jesse? Um, we were, we're still waiting for the, the NCAA, uh, the NCAA ruling on Kansas, expecting that per bill self, uh, late summer, early fall, nothing's changed on that timetable. Has it? Not at this point, and that's sort of the difficulty. You know, Bill Self, after the game last night, sort of lamented his team needed to go get more physical or more athletic, um, you know, infusion of talent, work on recruiting. But this is the great cloud that's hung over Kansas for a long time, and he's admitted that this has really hurt them in recruiting. And these aren't the typical Bill Self, you know, recruiting classes of the previous years. And so it's going to be difficult for KU to completely change over the roster and do something completely new and this is the hand they're dealt. And uh, if this thing does drag on and continue to drag on, it's not only going to continue to, to hurt them getting players, but you know, it makes you wonder just the future of next year's NCAA tournament and what will happen when that ruling, if that ruling comes down. So, you know, if it's in August, then maybe you have players transfer. If it's in mid October, it's probably too late because you're already in practices, but maybe guys would still want to leave and, and 
try to get themselves somewhere else. So that is the big unknown with Kansas right now. It, it doesn't seem like this is headed down a path where KU is going to get off scot-free. So this will be something that, K, that KU and Bill Self will continue to have to recruit against in the meantime. And then when the ruling comes, it's something they'll have to deal with the consequences of, especially if there's a postseason ban. So, yeah, a lot up in the air with KU basketball. And this might not be a roster situation Bill Self can fix as easily as he might have in some off-seasons past. Keep in mind, and this is an apples-to-orange comparison in terms of uh, – um, the, the types of violations, the penalties, but Oklahoma State was, you know, they, they received their penalties from the NCAA this year and decided to appeal. And while the appeal was going on, Oklahoma State was eligible for postseason play in the Big 12 tournament and the NCAA. So with Cade Cunningham, Oklahoma State got to continue to play its season and got to the NCAA tournament with a, with a great team, great season for the Cowboys. I suppose that... I, you know, when I mentioned the apples and oranges thing, you know, they, they they went through their or are going through their uh, enforcement from the from the NCAA. Kansas is is the independent uh, panel, and so th- there's a difference there. But I suspect when Kansas hears something, whenever that is, um, they're gonna they're gonna come out battling. <laughs> um, yeah, but and, and as you mentioned, Blair, this thing has taken so long, but there's no appeal process on this. Oh, thank you. When, when this the- thing is announced, it's announced. And so, um, you know, Bill Self has kind of threatened in the past. He's going to sue if things don't go his way, basically. Um, that seems sort of like something you threaten beforehand and not something you really want to carry out afterwards because – uh, that's something that gets stuck in court. We can talk about like the USC case. Some of those things are still playing out in court with the Reggie Bush stuff. So, um, yeah, it, th- this is how it's set up right now. Again, it's taken so much time. It's taken years uh, to get to even this point where it's a few months away. But as it stands right now, there is no appeal process for KU to go through. So if there is a punishment coming from the IARP, that's going to be the punishment that Kansas takes. Good to know. Thanks, Jesse. And uh, thanks, Gary. Appreciate uh, both you guys weighing in on Kansas and that ugly loss last night. Uh, like, I said, but but a good season overall for for Kansas. There'll be plenty to discuss when it comes to the Jayhawks uh, athletics in the coming weeks. And be absolutely rest assured that uh, nobody knows him better than than um, Jesse Newell and Gary Bedour. So thanks, guys, and we will uh, we'll talk again soon. Thanks. Thanks. That'll do it for today. Thanks to our Sportsbeat KC production staff of Derek Donovan, Beth Welsh, Monty Davis, Jeff Rosen, Chris Fickett, and Savannah Smith. A tip of the cap to Jesse Newell and Gary Bedore for stopping by and talking Kansas. Links to their stories can be found in the show notes and on kansascity.com. Hey, we have another deal for you. For a limited time, you can subscribe to Sports Pass for 99 cents a month. That's right, 99 pennies a month. After three months, it auto-renews at $5.99 a month, unless you cancel. And what a time to subscribe. The Royals are at spring training. March Madness is here, and even though it doesn't include Kansas or Missouri, there's still two great weeks left in the NCAA tournament. And, of course, it is never not Chiefs season. So how do you get it? You go to kansascity.com slash sportspass2020. That is kansascity.com slash sportspass2020. If you want more than just sports coverage, check out the entire Kansas City Star product. Sports news features, commentary, and analysis, the whole thing. You got all the stories written by my talented colleagues, plus additional national news, sports, and business coverage with the E-Edition. The details for all of these deals can be found at account.kansascity.com slash subscribe. And if you're having trouble hunting down any of these offers, you send me an email, bkirkhoff at kcstar.com, and I will get you to the right place. So... Whether it's a sports pass or the full subscription, you're getting and supporting the best sports and news coverage in Kansas City and helping us produce programs like Sports BKC. Thanks for listening. We'll be back on Wednesday with another episode. Mm-hmm.